I'm just a kid. I'm just a kid. <laughs> Sitting on a half blood hill. <laughs> What's good? And thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a 30-year-old man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I'm reading them now as an adult to determine if this is a book series that we should have been reading all along, and if this is something that's been slept on by society. I'm not on this quest alone, though. I am joined in the same room, seated very close to me, because we are sharing a microphone in our bedroom. It's my wife, as well as the creator, and I don't know if you have any other sort of title of Magic Shop Design, it's Kelly Beckman Schubert. Kelly, how's it going? Hi, it's me, Kelly Beckman Schubert. It's going well, sitting here in our little bedroom, talking into one microphone. What better way to spend a Wednesday morning? So we are here to discuss chapter 18 and as much of chapter 19 as we can get through of Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters. Now, we've already discussed your introduction to the Percy Jackson series, but how about you let people know, A, your thoughts on the Sea of Monsters in general, and B, how far you are in the Rick Riordan verse right now? Oh, yeah. So I resisted the Percy Jackson books for about 10 seconds when you started this. And then I zoomed through the first series and then I resisted the sequel series a little bit. But now I am done with House of Hades and I'm about to start The Blood of Olympus. And I am super excited about it. But I took a little pause and I re listened to, I listened to the audiobooks of one and two over the last couple of days in prep for this because I read so fast that I have forgotten a lot of what happened in the original series. So I am now re-caught up. I like The Sea of Monsters. I remember when I was reading it the first time through, I was really annoyed because I didn't want any new friends. I wanted just Annabeth, Percy, and Grover on another mission again and then Grover's gone, and Tyson's here, and I want to know new friends, but I love Tyson so much. And I think that Sea of Monsters is, I'm now thinking about this statement, I think it might be my favorite of the original series. Wow, that's very high praise. I mean, the no new friends thing was also the reason you didn't want to read the Heroes of Olympus, which is the sequel series, because it's written from other people's perspectives. I know. And then a little bit in, you were in love with all of them. I know. I think I I can't say too much to Mike about it, but I just keep telling him I love all my new friends. <laughs> well, there you go. So let's kick things off with chapter 18, which is called The Party Ponies Arrive. I was very happy to read this chapter title because where we last left our heroes, Luke was menacingly saying that our team was not going to be able to leave the cruise ship alive. But now if the party ponies arrive, I feel like, and I felt like when I read that at the time, chances of leaving the Princess Andromeda alive quite high. We've gone from bony ponies to party ponies. <laughs> <laughs> So as I've been doing for all the chapters in this book, I predicted what was going to happen in this chapter before reading it. My guess was Chiron's coming back. And what a tricky, difficult guess that was, given the chapter title. A real thinker it was, wasn't it? <laughs> Have you heard about his kin before? Yes. Earlier in this book, they mentioned that he's got a rambunctious family and we see one of the Iris messages calls that there's lots of partying going in the background. So I was not surprised that the party ponies were party ponies. <laughs> but it was fun to meet the very Floridian party ponies. <laughs> so we get a quote from Percy saying, one-on-one, -on -one, what are you afraid of? And I really just enjoyed the phrasing of one-on-one -on -one because I thought, ooh, are they going to play basketball against each other? Are they going to hoop? Unfortunately, the one-on-one -on -one they're referring to was not basketball, but I'm still holding out hope for one day there to be a basketball game in the Percy Jackson universe. To the death. <laughs> <laughs> so Luke's soldiers are awaiting his kill order, but before anything goes down, Agrius enters the scene with Luke's steed, and Luke's steed is an all-black Pegasus. And of course it would be, because that's Luke's entire vibe, is how can I be the most evil, please? I know, a black Pegasus. Yeah, but he's captured her and she does not want to be there. That is very true. We learned that. It makes me very sad. And we'll see what happens with this Black Pegasus. But I'm intrigued to see if Black Pegasus comes back around. So Percy can hear this 
Black Pegasus's thoughts, and she is cursing at Agrius and Luke. So immediately, I wanted Percy to free the Black Pegasus and steal Luke's steed and bring this Black Pegasus onto our Camp Half-Blood related team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Luke says, quote, I told you last summer, Percy, you can't bait me into a fight. And Percy says, and you keep avoiding one. Scared your warriors will see you get whipped. And this is good. It's good baiting. This is Percy proving that, yes, he can bait him into a fight. Yes, I was pleasantly surprised. I wrote in my notes, all caps, wait, does this work? Because narrator Percy feels like he's put Luke in a lose-lose situation. If Luke says no, he's going to look like a wimp. If he says yes, Luke is going to waste the time that he should be spending going after Clarice. So it's pretty genius stuff. I like that we've gone from trash-talking Percy to Percy very smartly employing his trash talk when the time is right for it. One of my favorite things about narrator Percy and in the sequel series narrator whoever is talking is that they always make some statement like, I bet he was thinking this and <laughs> make some very intuitive statement about what the other character is thinking. And I just go, oh, OK, that's Rick letting me know what the other character is thinking. This narrator has become super intuitive all of a sudden. It must be what Luke is actually thinking. With narrator Percy, I feel like it flows a little bit better. I like that Rick throws in these very intuitive narrator moments so we can get a glimpse at what the other character is thinking. I just think it's funny. Yeah, I've kind of written it off as Greek folk, whether it's demigods or centaurs or satyrs, whatever. I just feel like everyone has really heightened senses of perception. And that's how I've been justifying the, yeah, Percy can tell from Annabeth's eyebrow wrinkle what she's thinking. <laughs> I love it so much. But it also could just be like they're really good friends because... I have friends, you included, just based off of facial expression or an immediate reaction. I also have a very expressive face. You can tell exactly what I'm thinking. There are so many conversations between you and I that start with about three words and then go, I know, but, and then three more words and then, oh, I know, but, and we just like, I wonder how that conversation looks from the outside because it's not a full conversation. And every one out of 10, we come back to it the next day and discover that we weren't thinking the same thing that happened like yesterday when we realized we weren't on the same page about just like some like TV show we were both predicting and then we realized that. We thought we were understanding the other one 100 percent, but it was actually that we just cut each other off, assuming that we understood but had different opinions. Look, you're not going to hit every single thing 100 percent of the time. And that's why marriage is something that you work towards and you work <laughs> on. It was so funny, though. So Percy then considers how things are looking on his end, and he's confident in Annabeth's ability to come up with an escape plan for the team while he fights Luke, but he's also aware of how good Luke is at fighting, so he's a bit worried about himself in this whole big plan they've got going on. Luke raises Backbiter, which is still a horrible name, and he says, quote, I'll kill you quickly. Yeah, okay, sure, Luke. Mm -hmm, yep, that's going to go great. Uh, there are three more books. I feel like you're not going to kill Percy. <laughs> So narrator Percy describes the sword a little bit. And then when he gets to the two material nature of Backbiter, he says, quote, I could almost feel the blade fighting against itself like two opposing magnets bound together. I didn't know how the blade had been made, but I sensed a tragedy. Someone had died in the process. And I thought, is Backbiter a horcrux? What is going on? I got the same kind of vibe from it. And I want a side story about how this sword was created and why it was created. Was it Luke that asked for it? It's such an evil concept. I just want the side story of this sword. My guess would be that Kronos developed it because Kronos was probably looking for a demigod hero to put under his wing. So that would be my thought. Kronos is a pile of pieces right now. Yeah, but he still has evil influence. So he could have maybe evilly possessed someone in the Cyclops Forge to make it or something like that. I feel like it isn't Luke who made it. I feel like it's Kronos saying, my best chances of success are to have a demigod hero that I can manipulate. What's the best thing for him? A sword that can kill mortals and celestial beings. Mm, for me, I actually imagine this a little bit differently. I kind of imagine that this is showing how much Luke has turned, that he wanted this weapon. He went out and commissioned this weapon and found somebody who could make it and forced them to make it. And I've always looked at it as an indicator of how much he's changed and how evil he's turned that he went through the trouble of creating this weapon 
Yeah, I mean, I think either theory could work, and maybe I can add this to my growing list of questions to ask Rick Riordan if he ever comes on the pod. Yeah, or it already exists, and there's just so much out there I haven't found it yet. Right, maybe there is something. I know there's that book, The Demigod Files or something. We have the other Percy Jackson handbook thing, so maybe it's in some companion piece thing. I'll start looking. (laughs) Okay, you can research. I cannot. But also, this makes me wonder about people dying in the process to make evil weapons Sure, this is a thing with Harry Potter and Horcruxes, but I wonder if this is just a bigger fantasy thing. I'm not a huge fantasy novel guy, so I don't know some of the tropes. So I don't know if this is something that's already existed and two authors have just played upon this. But it's uh, an interesting concept for sure. Well, like in the Marvel movies, when it's so difficult to remake Thor's hammer, I kind of imagine it's something like that. Cut off his arm for it. I imagine it took something sacrificial, but the person who made it, it wasn't a sacrifice of love. It was a sacrifice of force. Yeah, and it wasn't an evil thing. It was a good thing. What? These weapons are evil. Thor's what? weapon is good. Yeah, we're on the opposite <laughs> side. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> So Luke whistles to a goon who tosses him a leather and bronze shield and then looks at Percy wickedly. And Annabeth says, Luke, at least give him a shield. And then Luke says, sorry, Annabeth, you bring your own equipment to this party, which is so whack. That's so whack. It's so wild because he didn't bring the shield. Somebody gave it to him, first of all. Second of all, if Percy's allowed to bring whatever he wants, then that kind of changes the equation a bit, too. Yeah, it's already probably not a fair fight given that Luke is older and stronger and more trained than Percy in fighting, but even now Luke has to give himself some sort of extra advantage. It's just so cheap and you have no sense of pride and honor. Where is the gentleman's duel honor of this duel? Well, what I immediately thought was we're in a boat right now surrounded by water. Surely Percy's going to Mm -hmm. use that water, which... He doesn't. He uses other water. He uses other water, but I'm like, oh, if that's the case, if we can use whatever we want, well, we're sitting on a boat in the middle of the water with the son of the sea god. Obviously, he's just going to sink the boat, but that didn't happen. I think the problem is they're on a cruise ship, not a boat, and a cruise ship is just a hotel on water. It's so big. They're so far away from the water. I guess it's a much more powerful thing. And speaking of the cruise ship... Recently, Rick Riordan and Becky Riordan's shared birthday because, yes, they have the same birthday. What? Yeah, which is very cool. Oh, my goodness. But Becky tweeted something about how the first cruise ship they ever were on was doing research for this book. And I thought that's got to be pretty sweet for Becky for Rick to say, hey, I'm going to write a book where they're going to cruise ship. Want to go on a cruise? I've been thinking that because as the series continues, they go to more places. What? Oh, (laughs) spoiler. (laughs) And every time they go to a new place, I imagine, I mean, Rick uses so much detail in talking about places when he's talking about places that I've been. I know exactly where he is. And so I just imagine that he goes to all of these places and I'm just like, wow, that's really cool. That sounds like an amazing thing. I'm like, hey, I'd like to go to blank. How about I write blank into my novel? Yeah, I got to find a way to host some sort of podcast where I can justify these sort of things. But then I would just be writing off the business expenses to my boss, who is me. So I would be paying for my own expenses. I don't really think I'm saving any money. You'd be giving yourself permission to spend a lot of money, but then write off those expenses so that you can pay for them. Right. The only benefit is I wouldn't have to pay taxes on it, but I would still have to pay for it. (laughs) So the fight begins and Luke immediately lunges at Percy and grazes his ribs with a slash. Percy jumps back and goes for a counterattack with Riptide, but Luke easily deflects it and then chides him by saying, quote, my Percy, you're out of practice. And he's returned in my brain to fancy British socialite Luke. Interesting. Okay. Just the way he talks, it feels like a very fanciful oh mm, <laughs> kind of villain. So Luke goes for Percy's head and Percy parries and returns the blow, but Luke is able to sidestep away. And I got to say, shout out to fencing class that I took at Rice for making me understand all this terminology. I took one semester of fencing, I had a great time, and I knew what all these words meant. I also like appreciate Rick's writing of it's not just like battle happened, it's an actual like play-by-play of what's 
happening. Right. And as I've always said on the pod, he does a good job of keeping it interesting and making it feel like it's part of the book. And it doesn't feel like the action sections are written by a different author. I was about to say that he didn't have a ghostwriter come in and be his fencing writer. (laughs) Exactly. So we've got another Luke lunge. But when Percy jumps back this time, he lands in the pool. And he feels a surge of power. Ooh, didn't see that there. (laughs) He creates a funnel cloud and blasts out of it right at Luke's head. And the force of the water knocks him to the ground. But he's still able to dodge a strike from Percy. I really appreciate this. And it also just shows how not the brightest Luke is. Because Luke should know, ah, fighting the water guy. Maybe we move away from the pool. Yeah, or maybe we don't do this in the middle of the ocean. I kept thinking that was going to come into play. (laughs) Like he was going to summon some like hippocampi to his aid or something. He gets a bunch of swordfish to fly out of the ocean and pierce through the window. (laughs) So Percy is able. (laughs) I'm just imagining Luke's sword with a bunch of uh, like a cartoon fish stuck in it. (laughs) So Percy's able to slash off a piece of Luke's shield, but he is unbothered by it. And unfortunately, Luke crouches and jabs like he's playing Street Fighter and he gets Percy in the thigh. And this strike in the thigh is so bad that Percy can't put any weight on it. And Grover bleats out Percy in sadness slash dismay. And oh, man, this is a crushing blow, literally, figuratively, all the ways. Ouchie. Mm hmm. Great analysis, Kelly. (laughs) Ouchie. Ouchie. So Percy is crawling towards the pool for safety, but it is looking rough. Luke starts to get cocky and taunts, quote, one thing I want you to watch before you die, Percy. And then he calls to Aureus, who is holding Annabeth and Grover, that he can now eat his dinner. And Aureus prepares to, but as narrator Percy says, that's when all Hades broke loose. And I love when they do this when they add in the Greek terms, but I also love that this is happening because I want everyone to be okay. This was really surprising to me because I thought that Luke still had some reservations about hurting Annabeth or Grover. When you think about it, Grover was the one who brought him back to camp. So he has some amount of love for him. And Annabeth was the one that he was on the run with for years. You imagine that he still has some sort of friendship for her still, some kind of feelings for her that he doesn't want to see her eaten at this point. And he just so casually is just like, all right, time to eat them. And in a really sadistic way in front of my enemy who is really going to hurt him. I was very surprised that he so callously threw that out. Right. I think that that is a very good point. And I feel like maybe the first clue of Luke truly turning bad is when he has no care for Thalia's tree. And at first I thought that this was him lying because my big prediction was that secretly he wasn't bringing Kronos back to life. He was bringing Thalia back to life with the coffin. Oh, that would have been really nice. Well, I thought he was doing it to turn her evil. Oh, never mind. (laughs) But but this was me giving Luke the benefit of the doubt because I thought surely there is no way he can have turned this evil. But no, he just has. And I think you're right. I think this is a testament to just how bad he has broken. So a red feathered arrow nails Aureus in the mouth. And I thought, Apollo, Artemis, forgetting the chapter title, Of the chapter. Party ponies! Party ponies. So Aureus hits the deck, and that causes Agrius to wail, brother, in dismay, and he eases up on the Pegasus's reins, and that's just enough for her to kick him in the face and flee. I really hope she comes back in the future. I hope that this is a rainbow situation where she's going to return, and this isn't her only mention. Luke's henchmen are stunned as the bear twins dissolve into smoke. This is very nice. We have two less people to have to fight. And narrator Percy says, quote, then there was a wild chorus of war cries and hooves thundering against metal. A dozen centaurs charged out of the main stairwell. And that's when I wrote in my notes, oh, right, the chapter title, You Doofus. (laughs) I'm very good at getting so engrossed in the chapter that I forget what the chapter title is or hints about what has happened a couple pages ago. I just get so into it. That's good because although the chapter titles are funny and sassy and cute, sometimes they give away stuff. I think they do sometimes, but there has been enough times where the chapter title is clearly meant to make you think one thing and then it's something else that I don't think I will ever believe, unless it's painfully obvious like this one. (laughs) There's always going to be a tiny voice in my head that goes, well, maybe it's a misdirect from Rick. Yeah. (laughs) So Tyson exclaims with joy, ponies, which is great. And narrator Percy describes the following scene. 
Chiron was among the crowd, but his relatives were almost nothing like him. There were centaurs with black Arabian stallion bodies, others with gold palomino coats, others with orange and white spots like paint horses. Some wore brightly colored t-shirts with dayglow letters that said party ponies, colon, South Florida chapter. Some were armed with bows, some with baseball bats, some with paintball guns, which I found very surprising, but also very Florida. One had his face painted like a Comanche warrior and was waving a large orange styrofoam hand, making a big number one. Another was bare-chested and painted entirely green. A third had googly eyeglasses with the eyeballs bouncing around on slinky coils and one of those baseball caps with soda can and straw attachments on either side. He's my favorite one. Really enjoy that guy. And this confirms my questioning earlier when Rick brought up Comanche warriors, if this is a well-known indigenous tribe and I just was unfamiliar with it because my mom loves to listen to the podcast and then text me everything. She's the only person who's allowed to send me corrections more than 24 hours after an episode goes live. (laughs) And one thing she said to me was, oh yeah, Comanche warriors are totally a thing. So this was just me missing it out. Or maybe this was something people Rick's age were more on top of or some sort of reference, but this is now the second time this has been brought up in this book. So it's totally a thing. But yeah, the party ponies, they're amazing. Party ponies. I imagine that the guy with the googly eye glasses, in my head, his name is Uncle Buck. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> because Buck like a horse. Oh. And, but also, we have an Uncle Buck, so th- yeah. Mm-hmm. We do have an Uncle Buck, and then there's a famous John Candy movie called Uncle Buck, where he is a very eccentric uncle. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, that's now canon. Yep, Uncle Buck. Mm -hmm. That's Uncle Buck the centaur. (laughs) Percy wonders if they came to party or attack, but apparently they came to do both. So Luke raises his sword to rally his troops, and one centaur uses a trick arrow that has a boxing glove at the end of it to clock Luke in the face and send him crashing into the swimming pool. Amazing. Cannot wait to see this in the TV show. This is my favorite. This is my favorite part. When I was reading it last night, you heard me like crack up on the couch reading this. I love a good slapstick humor that doesn't really hurt somebody. (laughs) It would be really funny. I don't know what the art style of the show is, but if they went into the Spider-Verse on it and threw in some comic book elements, this colliding with Luke's head and then making some sort of thing that says bonk or biff or whatever would be really fun. I imagine him doing the classic, like his head moves with the arrow now and his body trails behind. (laughs) So Luke's gaggle of goons scatter and one pony yells, come get some. And I really enjoy the pony who yelled, come get some. (laughs) The ponies shower the goons with paintball pellets, which impedes their ability to run because it makes things slippery. And Chiron scoops up Annabeth and Grover, placing them on his back. And then I remembered, oh, right. Didn't Chiron say something about Miami when they were talking to him earlier and the service was cutting in and out? I'm guessing what he was saying that we didn't hear was come to Miami and we'll save you or we're in Miami. It made sense that the party ponies arrived when they arrived in Miami. Party ponies. I also would imagine, I would assume Disney could get the rights to this, but if they could have Will Smith's Miami playing in the background of the TV show while they're doing this, while all Hades is breaking loose, and you've just got party in the city where the heat is on all night on the beach to the break down. Going to Miami. Welcome to Miami. It'll be so good. <laughs> Bienvenido a Miami. Which are there some lady centaurs party ponies? Well, I don't Did know. Did we get introduced to any? Lady party ponies? They don't specifically say that there are any, but that doesn't mean that there aren't unless I'm not well versed in the Greek mythology of it all. I'll have to ask Dr. Moya, are lady centaurs a thing or is it a race of being where there's just dudes? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Like the Ents where they lost all the Ent wives. It's like the centaurs. They lost all the centaur wives. Right. I don't know. They don't explicitly say one way or another, but I I don't know. Could be a possibility. They partied too much and drove off all the females. (laughs) I mean, yeah, maybe that's the case. It's just they were just so bro-ish and gross and awful that all the ladies left. Or the centaurs just come into being some other way and then they never procreate and they're just immortal and they don't need ladies. Right. Could be that. I'm not sure. I'll have to ask Dr. Maya. Where are all the ladies? (laughs) Yeah, tea time. (laughs) (laughs) You should probably just clarify that that's because we play the Pride and Prejudice board (laughs) game and it's a joke and that you don't think the woman's (laughs) place where they belong to be. 
is either the kitchen or the tea time room. Well, obviously, if I was a lady centaur, I'd be the one with the boxing glove arrow. <laughs> but there's a game we play called Marrying Mr. Oh, Darcy. We've talked about it on the pod. Oh, Don't okay. worry. <laughs> and there's a card called Tea Time when all the ladies go to tea time and you roll to see what happens at tea time. Usually it involves talking trash about people, yeah, which yeah. is really good. So Percy's leg is still too painful to put weight on it. So Luke commands his henchmen to attack and an alarm bell below deck begins to ring out. And that, of course, worries Percy. Tyson knocks a half dozen goons overboard, which is fantastic. But reinforcements are still pouring in. Chiron calls for his warriors to withdraw. And Luke says, quote, you won't get away with this horseman. And this is just his bad rendition of calling Grover goat boy. And now Chiron horseman. Not very clever name calling from Luke here. And what's great is promptly after saying this, he gets hit in the face with another boxing glove arrow, knocking him into a deck chair. I enjoy that this centaur not only has great aim, but also great comedic timing. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so a Palomino centaur tells Percy, quote, dude, get your big friend. And Percy then calls out to Tyson. And narrator Percy says, Tyson dropped the two warriors he was about to tie in a knot and jogged after us. He jumped onto the centaur's back. And then the centaur says, Dude, do the words low-carb diet mean anything to you? And this is very dad of Uncle Rick to say, oh, we have a party pony. Let's make them say dude and stuff. What would a dude hippie party pony like? I don't know. The Atkins diet. <laughs> So the goons organize themselves into a phalanx, but by the time it is formed, the centaurs have already reached the edge of the deck and they jump over the guardrail. Narrator Percy says, quote, as if it were steeplechase and not 10 stories above the ground. And shout out to steeplechase, you and I's favorite roller coaster at Coney Island here in New York. I just totally glazed over this while I was reading it. I was like, must be some video game. I don't know. Oh, yeah, I love steeplechase. Steeplechase, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's some sort of horse race. Maybe they have to jump over water because there's also a track and field event steeplechase where it's hurdles, but one of the hurdles is kind of more of a long jump, and there's a puddle of water that you have to jump over. What? Uh, okay, wait. So are we referring to the roller coaster here or to something else? No, Uncle Rick is not referring to the roller coaster in Coney Island. Why not? <laughs> I mean, maybe Percy could be if he's been on steeplechase at Coney Island. I mean, Percy's from New York. He's probably been on steeplechase in Coney Island. I believe what Percy is referencing is the actual horse racing event steeplechase. What I like to imagine is that the last time I went to Coney Island and I rode steeplechase about 10 times, there was also like a 10-year-old boy who his dad was standing off to the side because I think he was too tall to ride. I think you can be too tall to ride that ride. Oh. And I was not too tall to ride the ride. Well, I've been on the ride. I, you got If the, you have to be too tall, you have to be really, really too tall. All right, never mind. His dad just didn't want to go on the ride. <laughs> so his, he like sat next to me. There was nobody in line. So me and this kid were in the front two seats just riding steeplechase like 10 times in a row. We'd get to the end and we'd go, another, another. And then the ride operator would be like, another. And we'd be like, another. And so I imagine Percy was this little kid sitting next to me riding steeplechase with nobody else in Coney Island. Were you at Coney Island more recently than the time we went together and rode it? Because you said your last time at Coney Island and I was the person who was riding steeplechase with you. All right, let me rephrase. <laughs> the first time I was okay, at Coney I was Island. Say, did you just confuse me for a small child? Because <laughs> we rode steeplechase a lot because some of the rides were closed down. But also, it's a very cool ride. You sit in a horse-shaped type little cart thing and you lean forward and there's reins and stuff and it's a race. It's very fun. And Google tells me that steeplechase is a distance horse race in which competitors are required to jump diverse fence and ditch obstacles. And one of them is this big puddle of water that you got to jump over. Oh. So yeah, it is an actual horse racing event, but it is also a very cool roller coaster. Well, I'm talking about the time that I went to Coney Island in 2014 before I knew you. So I didn't talk to the kid that much. Maybe it was you. Oh, my God. Although I did learn that it was the reason he was so excited to be riding steeplechase so many times is he and his dad go to Coney Island once a year, every year in the summer. And he was too short last year to ride that ride. And he really wanted to ride it. And this was the first year he was tall enough to ride it. So he was riding it just like over and over and over again. So I guess I did talk to the kid. Well, there you go. So Percy thinks that they're goners, but they land safely and gallop away. And they're yelling taunts at the Princess Andromeda as they ride down the streets of downtown Miami. Narrator Percy says, quote, I have no idea what the Miamians thought as we gallop by. And I wrote, and eh, they probably thought nothing of it because it's Florida. Anything is possible. Everything is normal. It's a herd of galloping gators. And they're like, oh, 
Okay. Just another day in Florida. So the centaurs pick up speed as to what feels like an impossible amount, and Percy notes that it feels as if space is compacting around them. And then they arrive at a trailer park near a lake, and the trailers are horse trailers, which is great, but they are all tricked out with gear, and this is the centaur camp. And now that we're here at the centaur camp, let's take a little bit of a break for the sea of sponsors where we can talk about (laughs) fun stuff going on with the new Olympian. There's a live show, there's merch, lots of fun stuff. Hello and welcome to the Sea of Sponsors. This is a special edition of the Sea of Sponsors where I am coming to you live from Chicago where I have my phone planted against a couch to try to reduce echo noises. Yes, I'm on tour with Potterless Live. Got some shows coming up. You can go to potterlesspodcast.com slash live if you want to get tickets. But let's talk about a few announcements. First, as I did allude to in the transition into the Sea of Sponsors, we are having a live show. It's in New York City. It's going to be on August 24th, the first ever TNO live show. You can get tickets to it right now at thenewstolympian.com slash live. I also mentioned merch in the transition, and you can get merch at thenewstolympian.com slash merch. Second, just a reminder that there is one more book episode about the Sea of Monsters. We will also be joined by Kelly. But then after that, we will be doing the Dr. Moya Mythology Roundup episode, where we cover all the mythological stories and figures figures found in this book. Now, a separate reminder is that for Ultra God tier patrons, if you're at the highest tier of our Patreon, you become a member of the Olympic Court, where you get to decide at different points in time what we cover on the podcast, and the Dr. Moya Mythology episodes is included in that. I've posted something for those patrons to say, hey, what myths do you want to hear the most about? There's polls that you can vote in and all that kind of good stuff. So if this is something that interests you, head on over to the newstolympian.com slash Patreon and join the Ultra God tier and join the Olympic Court. You can help us shape future episodes of the show. Woo! Speaking of that Patreon, though, I want to thank the newest members of our team over at the newstolympian.com slash Patreon. So shout out to our newest Mega God tier patrons, Laura Bear, Elizabeth Kiefer, and Grace Sissom. Shout out to our newest Super God tier patron, Yvonne, and shout out to our newest God tier patron, Brittany Alvis. Thank you all so much for your support. May Hephaestus bless any sort of public transit ride that you take to make sure that there are no breakdowns that cause delays. Also, I'd like to thank Multitude for having us as part of the collective. If you're looking for new podcasts to listen to, maybe you've caught up on the newest Olympian and Horse and Meddling Adults and Potterless and Modern Muckraker and all the other stuff I make, and you're like, man, I just can't get enough. I need some new shows. Well, guess what? There's a whole bunch of Multitude shows beyond the ones that I work on that are so great, and I think you will like them. One that I think you would really enjoy is Exolore, especially if you like Dr. Moya, you know, the person in the upcoming Dr. Moya mythology episodes. If you've ever wondered what life would be like on a planet different from our own or how writers create your favorite fictional worlds, Exolore is the podcast for you. Over the course of Exolore's run, they've created so many magical, scientifically sound worlds, and I even guessed it on an episode to do a bracket to determine which of these is the best. It's a very fun show. The guests that Moya gets are absolutely incredible. Moya herself, she is absolutely incredible. You will learn, you will laugh, and you will gain an appreciation for how special our planet really is. You can listen today by searching for Exolore, that is E-X-O-L-O-R-E, in your podcasting app, or you can go to Exolore lorepod.com. And finally, before we wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of these ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in Chicago, don't be surprised if you hear an ad for deep dish pizza, which really is just a casserole pretending to be pizza. It's still very good. It's just not pizza. And once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The New Olympian. And we're back. So the dude bro centaur says, quote, dude, did you see that bear guy? He was all like, whoa, I have an arrow in my mouth. Rick, you know, I love he's having a fun time being a dad in the mid to late 2000s. I love to do this. He's thriving. (laughs) So Uncle Buck, the googly eyed glasses centaur says that was awesome. Head slam. And just, oh, man, it's just so what a dad thinks a bro is. And you got to love it. Somebody's got to be that bro. It's a centaur bro. (laughs) So Chiron says, I really wish my cousins wouldn't slam their heads together. They don't have the brain cells to spare. And I feel like referencing brain cells is such a relic of the late 90s and early 2000s. I remember that being a thing, like specifically calling out people if you wanted to say they were unintelligent, saying they don't have a lot of brain cells. I remember as a kid, someone saying, oh, if you make a snort noise, you lose two brain cells. So I never wanted to snort. What? I don't know. I just remember brain cells being more in the zeitgeist when I was a kid. Maybe they're more in the zeitgeist of kids and kids talk about brain cells more because they've just learned what 
cells are. I'll have to reach out to a current kid and see if that is something that is still around. Current kids, do you talk <laughs> about brain cells? So a stunned Percy thanks Chiron for saving them, and Chiron says that he couldn't just let them die, especially after Percy just cleared his name. So sweet. I love Chiron. I missed Chiron. I'm glad he's back. Annabeth asks how they knew where they were, which I was also wondering, and Chiron says, quote, advanced planning, my dear. I figured you would wash up near Miami if you made it out of the Sea of Monsters alive. Almost everything strange washes up near Miami, and just the disdain that Uncle Rick has for Florida is palpable, and I love it. So funny. So Grover mumbles, gee, thanks, and Chiron immediately tries to clarify that he didn't mean it that way. He says, I am glad to see you, my young satyr. The point is I was able to eavesdrop on Percy's Iris message and trace the signal. Iris and I have been friends for centuries. I asked her to alert me to any important communications in this area. It then took no effort to convince my cousins to ride to your aid. As you see, centaurs can travel quite fast when we wish to. Distance for us is not the same as distance for humans. And I did find it kind of funny that Chiron basically Basically, has a wiretap on Percy. He's tapped his phone. (laughs) So Percy then sees three of the centaurs teaching Tyson how to use a paintball gun, and he hopes they know what they're getting themselves into. He asks Chiron what's the plan now, asking if they're really just going to let Luke sail away with Kronos, or at least parts of Kronos, on the ship. So Chiron kneels down, and he tends to Percy's wounds, and he explains that today was a draw. They didn't have the numbers to stop Luke, but Luke didn't have the organization to pursue after them. Annabeth chimes in, but we got the fleece, and that Clarice is headed back to camp with it. And Chiron gives a classic Chiron non-answer, which I'm going to start calling a Chi (laughs) non-answer. I'm a very funny boy. And he just says, quote, you're all true heroes. As soon as we get Percy fixed up, you must return to Half-Blood Hill. The centaurs shall carry you. So Percy asks Chiron if he's going to join them, and he confirms because, one, his brethren don't appreciate Dean Martin, which I think is great that he's called this out. I don't think it's great that they don't appreciate Dean Martin. What don't people like about Dean Martin? I don't know. I love Dean Martin. Very soothing music. Wonderful. Two, he must have some words with Mr. D. Three, ever the teacher that Chiron is, he wants to begin planning the rest of the summer. And four, he's curious about the fleece. So many reasons for Chiron to go back to camp. Wonderful reasons. Percy doesn't know exactly what Chiron's getting at with the fleece comment, but it makes Luke saying that he would just let Percy take it when he was done with it more concerning to Percy. So he wonders if it was just a lie, since Cronus usually tricks people into doing his bidding without them knowing. But Tyson then starts paintballing with the centaurs, and it gets more reckless, and it causes Chiron to ask Annabeth and Grover to go over and supervise, but Percy notes them exchanging a bit of a look, so it is very much an excuse for Chiron to talk to Percy alone, but Percy doesn't raise any sort of hubbub about it because he knows this is what Chiron wants, but let him have it. And probably also wants to talk to Chiron alone. So. Yeah, not going to argue with this. <laughs> Annabeth to Grover says, come on, go boy. And Grover says, but I don't like paintball. And Annabeth says, yes, you do, and whisks him away. (laughs) Chiron finishes wrapping up Percy's leg, and he tells him that he had a talk with Annabeth about the prophecy on the way here. And Percy's not feeling great about this, so he immediately takes the blame so that Annabeth doesn't get in trouble. And he says, I made Annabeth tell me. Percy is so kind, and I love that he's always trying to keep Annabeth and his other friends out of trouble when it's his fault or even just partially his fault. It's such a great friend instinct. Percy's a really good friend. I held her at sword point and made her tell me. (laughs) I forced it out of her. Chiron's eyes flicker with irritation, and my thought was, oh, was he not going to tell him about this? And is this a separate thing? Did Percy just screw himself over? But no, that's not the case. I didn't know what he was annoyed at. What was he irritated with? I don't know. Maybe he's just frustrated that Percy made... Annabeth tell him maybe he's just frustrated at Percy's adolescent tendencies to not be able just to wait for someone to tell him when it's important. I don't know. Maybe it's just Chiron having to deal with a kid and go, God, kids. (laughs) Anyway, Chiron's expression changes to a weary one, and he admits that he couldn't expect it to be a secret forever. Percy asks if he's the one in the prophecy, and Chiron says he can't know until Percy turns 16. And at this point, I realized, oh, Percy's 13 in book two. If he keeps aging up at the rate he is, he'll be 16 in book five, right? Because he'd be 14 in the next book, 15 in the fourth book, and or no, he'd be 15. So he's, no, that's not going to happen. We're going to have to have a situation where he ages up more frequently than one year a book. I have no comment. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Chiron says all they can do now is train Percy as best as they can and leave the future to the fates. I mean, I would think it would be very dramatic if a major plot point of book five is 
Percy's 16th birthday. So I would not be surprised if you turn 16 during that book or at least during a book. But yeah, that's got to be a thing. Now, Chiron mentioning the fates is a light bulb moment for Percy, who thinks back to them snipping a life string in book one. He thinks that the death they foretold is his death when he turns 16. And Chiron assures him that they can't know whether or not it's about him. But Percy reminds him that there aren't any other half-blood children of the big three, but Chiron corrects him in classic Chiron form and says that we know of, because obviously Thalia fits that bill, and she's coming back for sure. Again, <laughs> I have no comment. <laughs> Percy yells that Cronus is rising and will destroy Olympus, and Chiron says he will try, and he'll try to topple Western civilization along with it if they don't stop him, but they will stop him, will in italics, and Percy won't be alone in that fight. Percy knows Chiron's just trying to make him feel better, but he also hasn't forgotten what Annabeth said, that it's going to come down to just one hero and one decision that would save or destroy the West. Percy thinks the fates were warning about that and that something terrible will either happen to him or someone he's close to. And this just made me worried. If Thalia does come back and she becomes the new person, are we going to get a second Thalia sacrifice? Because that would just be crushing if she has basically sacrificed herself to become a tree and now she has to sacrifice herself again. Hoi yoi. I think I've said this on a live stream once. Somebody asked if you could do like one special episode, what would you do? And I said I would do a special episode on the prophecies, mainly because I can't keep all the prophecies straight. And I want to do a decisive once all the books are over, because you have to also then point out how the prophecies came to be and everything. But like already now we've got two prophecies and I'm already getting all mixed up and it just becomes more and more as it goes on. And I'm just so mixed up in my head. It could be a fun bonus episode for Patreon. It could be a fun live show episode. It's going to be in like 10 years. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, not that long. I think I mapped it out. It's not going to be 10 years. <laughs> well, there's also the sequel series to consider. Oh, yes, 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 yes of the course. Prophecies just that will you. be 10 years, but that's okay. Job security. We. <laughs> so Percy says to Chiron miserably, I'm just a kid, Chiron. What good is one lousy hero against something like Kronos? I was thinking of the um, I'm just a bill song. Oh. <laughs> I'm just a kid. Oh, I'm just a kid. I'm Sitting a kid. on a half blood hill. <laughs> <laughs> Chiron says, what good is one lousy hero? Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain said something like that to me once just before he single handedly changed the course of your civil war. And I wondered, is this a future character or a historical figure? And I didn't want to Google it because I didn't want it to be clear. Because sometimes when you Google character names, it will say so-and-so who dies in book whatever. So I'm not looking that up. Kelly, could you let me know who the heck Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is? Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is a veritable icon of Civil War legend. Ah. Best known for his heroic participation in the Battle of Gettysburg. Chamberlain and his regiment to the 20th Maine Infantry gained notoriety for their desperate bayonet charge down Little Round Top on the second day of the battle, a feat that figures prominently in Michael Sarah's novel, The Killer Angels. Michael Sarah from Juno? <laughs> okay, stop. Was he on the Union or the Confederates? Union. All right, good. <laughs> I mean, I would assume if Chiron yeah. <laughs> was talking about him positively. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, before they wrote the Articles of Secession, which mentioned <laughs> which mentioned slavery 30-something times. But I do love when Chiron mentions real-world historical figures that were actually demigods. I do love that. It's always a fun time. I loved that in this book we learned about Amelia Earhart. That was one of the ones I think I was trying to keep secret from you. Last time we recorded, you asked if they were real-world figures, and that was the one that really stuck out to me. Chiron pulls out a celestial bronze arrow and asks Percy what would happen if he shot it at a human. Percy says it would pass right through them, and Chiron tells him that is correct, adding that humans aren't even on the same level as immortals. They can't be hurt by celestial weapons. But Percy is part god and part human and all hero. And that's what the UK covers say on the front. They say part boy, part god, all hero. Oh my god. Pretty bad. He can be harmed by both, and he can affect both, and that is what makes heroes special. They carry the hopes of humanity into the realm of the eternal. It's really sweet. Such good writing. He continues that monsters never die, but are reborn from the chaos and barbarism that burbles under civilization, and heroes embody the struggle of needing to constantly squash them. They fight the battles humanity must win every generation. This was nice. 
This was very motivational, and it felt very teachery of Chiron because he's got the visual aid, and he asks leading questions that help out in different <laughs> ways. I thought it was really, really nice and on brand. Mm -hmm. Chiron asks Percy if he understands. He hesitates and says he doesn't know. Chiron says Percy must, because whether or not Percy is the subject of the prophecy, Cronus believes he is, big Voldemort, Neville versus Harry energy here, oh, yeah. and quote, after today, he will finally despair of turning you to his side. That is the only reason he hasn't killed you yet, you know. As soon as he's sure he can't use you, he will destroy you. So I was confused just based on the wording here when it says he will finally despair of turning you to his side. Does that mean based on this fight with Luke, Kronos is going to give up on Percy? Yeah, Luke has tried to turn Percy multiple times throughout this book, right? And I think now he finally sees because Percy fought to the death rather than turn. I think he's like, all right, this is a lost cause. He'd rather die than join me. Gotcha, gotcha. So Percy tells Chiron that he talks like he knows Kronos, and Chiron says that he does, causing narrator Percy to note that sometimes he forgets just how old Chiron is. He asks if that's why Mr. D blamed the tree situation on him and why some people don't trust him, and Chiron confirms. Percy asks why anyone would think Chiron would destroy Camp Half-Blood for Kronos, and Chiron looks very sad in the eyes and avoids answering, classic Kynon answer, but instead he says, Percy, remember your training. Remember your study of mythology. What is my connection to the Titan Lord? And I thought, oh, he actually is going to answer this question. A rare direct answer from Chiron. Percy says, you, uh. Right, Chiron, the point, no? <laughs> Chiron subject? Right, right Chiron subject. <laughs> <laughs> Percy says, you uh, owe Cronus a favor or something? He spared your life. And Chiron says, Percy. And narrator Percy says his voice became impossibly soft. The Titan Kronos is my father. And that was very surprising. Here is an audio clip of me reading this in real time. Kronos is Chiron's... What? Kronos is his father? So that is the end of chapter 18. Now let's get into chapter 19, which is called The Chariot Race Ends With a Bang. So my guess here was that they were going to have a race back to camp against Luke to return the fleece, and it ends with some sort of explosion. We'll see how correct that is. I just thought, no way are they going to actually just do the chariot race again. Huh? <laughs> but the other thing I wrote down was, is Tyson's device finally going to come into play? Because I didn't know what it was, but I was thinking, has Tyson been making a bomb? Is that the explosion? Oh so we'll see how that prediction holds up. So our team arrives in Long Island just after Clarice, thanks to the centaur speed. Percy rode on Chiron's back the way there. They didn't talk much, especially not about Kronos, since Percy knows that it must have been hard for Chiron to tell him. So he doesn't want to push it any further because Percy is a good, considerate person that doesn't like to push people on uncomfortable subjects when he can tell they don't want to talk about it. What a nice guy. What a nice lad. Narrator Percy says, quote, I mean, I've met plenty of embarrassing parents, but Kronos, the evil Titan Lord who wanted to destroy Western civilization, not the kind of dad you invited to school for career day. Incredible. At Camp Half-Blood, the centaurs are excited to meet Dionysus because of his legendary and literal use of the word legendary parties, but they are disappointed to see Mr. D instead, especially given his mood. Narrator Percy says, the camp had been through a hard two weeks. The arts and crafts cabin had burned to the ground by a Draco Ionis, Narrator Percy says, which as near as I could figure, was Latin for really big lizard with breath that blows stuff up. And thankfully... I took Latin in high school, so I can tell you what this actually means. Draco means dragon in Latin, and Aeonis means eternal. So I guess really old lizard would be more accurate than really big lizard. Wait a second. Draco's name is Draco? I guess, yeah. He's Dragon Malfoy. I'm not surprised J.K. Rowling just butchered Latin all over the place in he's the Harry Potter books. Dragon Malfoy? Yeah, because he's the bad guy, Kelly. He has to have some sort of evilish name. That's why his son is named Scorpius, because it kind of sounds like Scorpion. Oh my gosh, Scorpion Dragon. I'm now looking up Malfoy in Latin means bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Mal, like a story more mal. Malus means bad, yes. and Mal means pale. So he's a pale, bad dragon. There you go. Very creative stuff. Oh, my God. She puts so much work into these names, and then Cho Chang is just two different Asian last names smashed together. What a genius author. When you name your kid Dragon Bad Pale, what do you expect him to grow up when to When you be? name your werewolf teacher Wolf Wolfhead. <laughs> 
Narrative Percy continues, the big house's rooms were overflowing with wounded. The kids in the Apollo cabin, who were the best healers, had been working overtime performing first aid. Everybody looked weary and battered as we crowded around Thalia's tree. So once Clarice puts the golden fleece over the lowest bow, which, shout out to all the people in an earlier episode when I said I didn't know what the bow of a tree was, everyone was like, um, don't you know Rocket by Baby, the nursery rhyme lullaby song? First off, haven't sung that song since I was five, six, seven years old. Second, Rocket by Baby is a terrible lullaby. It is a song about a baby being left on a tree and then falling off of a tree. It's a horrible lullaby. When I have sung to my nephew in the past, I don't sing classic nursery rhymes. I sing like BTS songs and stuff to him. <laughs> Just as soothing. He doesn't know the difference. I'm glad that I forgot about Rocket by Baby because in that song, someone has put a baby on the top of a tree, on the treetop. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall and down will come baby cradle at all. It's a, what? How irresponsible. Yeah, it's like, I can't be bothered to rock this child. Let me put it on a tree. Maybe the wind will blow and rock it to sleep. And let me put it at the top of the tree. Yeah, maybe it'll fall and I won't have to deal with this baby anymore. Oh my God. So I think it's okay that I didn't remember bow. Anyway, Clarice puts the golden fleece over the bow of the tree and immediately the moonlight seems to brighten. The breeze rolls in. Fireflies grow brighter. The strawberry fields smell better. And the sound of the waves crashing is louder. Little by little, the pine needles turn from brown to green, and everyone cheers in excitement. Yay! <laughs> so Chiron orders a 24-7 guard on the hilltop until a proper monster protector is found, and apparently he's putting an ad in Olympus Weekly, which is wild that there's a newspaper, and I need to know everything about it and its production. Is there a sports section? What is going on? Is there a funnies section? I'm very intrigued. This would be a great companion novel for these like what's coming out in Olympus <laughs> weekly while this is happening yes meanwhile Clarice is being carried to the amphitheater on her cabin mates' shoulders she's then given a laurel wreath and a campfire celebration which is great love this for her no one's paying attention to Percy and Annabeth it's as if they never left but Percy realizes that that is probably the best case scenario because if their sneaking out was brought to light, they would be expelled forever. So probably OK. Mm -hmm. Narrator Percy then says later that night, as we were roasting s'mores and listening to the Stoll brothers tell us a ghost story about an evil king who was eaten alive by demonic breakfast pastries. I need this story. Clarice shoved me from behind and whispered in my ear, just because you were cool one time, Jackson, don't think you're off the hook with Ares. I'm still waiting for the right opportunity to pulverize you. And Percy smiles. Clarice is confused and asks what? And Percy says nothing, just good to be home. And I was a little sad here because I thought that maybe they were going to be at the point where Clarice fully embraced a friendship with Percy. But I get that she still has to keep up her bully facade. I also get that the Ares cabin is not going to love Percy because he did defeat Ares in a duel. So maybe she has to keep this up for the optics as her being one of the more prominent figures, if not the most prominent figure in the cabin. So I get it. But I was also just rooting for them to put all of their differences aside and become friends immediately. I kind of felt like this was the logical next step, right? You go from hating each other's guts to kind of jokingly hating each other and then that's how things progress right i guess i don't know if this was a joke or if clarice truly means it we'll have to see how future interactions between the two of them go and maybe it's just a small step towards them becoming friends but i do really really want it i really thought that it was her like playfully punching him being like just because you were cool once yes and i guess that's a hard thing to read versus tone of voice so I guess it's what I wanted. Right. And Percy didn't note that he didn't say anything like he could tell or perceive that she was joking or keeping it up for appearances. So we'll have to see. Where's our super intuitive narrative Percy? <laughs> Come all of a on, Percy. Tell us what she's thinking, Percy. So the next morning, the centaurs return to Florida and Chiron makes a surprise announcement that the chariot races will resume as normal. So my guess was to channel Mike Breen, one of the NBA broadcasters, when someone misses a shot. Way off! My prediction was completely wrong. They are just doing chariot races. <laughs> but the explosion could still be Luke and Kronos. I'm not sure yet. I haven't read that far. So maybe I'm not super duper mega wrong. So Tyson is still shook by the first chariot pigeon of death situation. So he instead gladly allows for Percy to team up with Annabeth. I'm very excited for this because they are the dream team that should be together. And I'm glad that they are finally getting that opportunity. 
So the plan is that Percy's going to drive, Annabeth is going to defend, and Tyson is going to serve as the pit crew. And that really is the dream team right there. Makes sense. I also started imagining that there could be a video game based off of this. You could have PJO team racing, like Crash Team Racing or something like Mario Kart with the Percy Jackson characters. It'd be really fun. That'd be really fun. Do you think we can get a Percy world in Disney World? If the show is successful... I think it could happen. If they made a world based on Avatar, Blue Pocahontas, a movie that nobody cares about, I feel like Percy Jackson world could happen. And they gave Avatar the best rides just because rides are getting better and better. Yeah, technology yeah, yeah. gets better. So, oh, man, can we get like an Olympus? <gasps> It'd be Ooh. really cool. A Camp Half-Blood would be e- awesome. They could also merge it with uh, Hercules, too. Mm. So that would, I mean, yeah. double ins- they love doing multiple characters in one world. Could be really good. So Percy's talking to the horses and Tyson is fixing up Annabeth's chariot and adding special modifications, which has me very excited. They spend the next two days and I wrote my notes, two days, what is Luke doing? Get off your butt, Luke, come on. (laughs) They spend the next two days training. Annabeth and Percy agree that if they win, the no chores for the rest of the month prize would be shared between their cabins. And Percy agrees since Athena has more campers. And I mean, yeah, cabin three is two people. So that wouldn't make any sense not to split it. What do you mean, what is Luke doing? He made it seem like he is getting to camp because he needs a new fighter or whatever. Clearly, he's got to try to get Thali out of Thalia's tree. He's taking his sweet time to get back to Camp Half-Blood. Oh, you think Luke is following them to Camp Half-Blood? A thousand percent. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I was like, what are you talking about? Did you mean Percy or? No, I think Luke is taking way too long. Batten down the hatches. Come on. Okay. All right. Continue. <laughs> Percy doesn't care about the prize. He just wants to win. And this is something I can understand as someone who tries hard in Central Park softball games and pick up basketball and things that don't ultimately matter in the grand scheme of things. But I will say I have been very on my best behavior in the Central Park Softball League to not take it too seriously because it is just a bunch of people in their 30s and 40s playing softball. (laughs) Also, you're one who does not like to do chores, though. So. I do not like to do chores. There are certain chores I don't mind. Dishes, big fan of. Everything big else. Big fan. Yeah, I love doing More the like dishes. More like a reluctant fan. I enjoy doing the dishes because I can throw on a podcast and just vibe out. Dishes, love them. Everything More else, More like eh. fair weather fan. <laughs> you'll do the dishes, but then you'll ask me, why do you never do the dishes, too? Yeah, I mean, okay. I don't mind the act of doing it. I don't enjoy always doing them. <laughs> And I say it's because I'm busy doing everything else. <laughs> that is untrue. I do all of our laundry. That's true. That, that, but yeah, that's true. So the night before the race, Percy is in the stables giving the horses a final brushing when a dude in a postal outfit comes from behind and says, fine animals, horses. Wish I'd thought of them. One, this is Hermes. Two, Poseidon invented horses will never cease to be hilarious to me. It's Love just it. so funny to have someone invent the concept of an animal. It makes sense. It's just so funny. Great animal to invent, too. Oh, yeah. Horses are great. Totally makes sense. Percy stammers and goes, Hermes? Hermes asks if Percy didn't recognize him without his jogging clothes. And Percy goes, uh. And narrator Percy says, I wasn't sure whether I was supposed to kneel or buy stamps from him or what. Hilarious. <laughs> Percy then realizes why he's here and says, listen, Lord Hermes, about Luke. And Hermes raises an eyebrow. Percy continues, uh, we saw him all right, but... And then Hermes asks, you weren't able to talk sense into him? And I thought here, are you Hermes? Shouldn't you know what's going on? You are a Greek god. Are you not aware of what's happening? Or are you intentionally acting like you don't know what's going on? Percy continues, well, we kind of tried to kill each other in a duel to the death. And Hermes then replies, I see. You tried the diplomatic approach. A very good reply. Touche here from Hermes. Percy apologizes, even mentioning how great Hermes' gifts were, but says that Luke has turned bad, really bad, and Luke feels like Hermes has abandoned him. Percy waits for Hermes to get angry or turn him into a hamster or something, but instead he sighs and asks, do you ever feel like your father abandoned you, Percy? And narrator Percy goes, oh man, and then next line, continuing. Rick is really good at the doing something and then breaking for the next line at dramatic moments. Mm -hmm. Narrative Percy continues, saying that he wanted to say only a few hundred times per day and notes that he hasn't spoken to Poseidon since last summer and he's never been to his palace and the whole Tyson situation just got dropped on him with, quote, no warning, no explanation, just boom, you have a brother. You'd think that deserved a little heads up phone call or something. And I really appreciate this because that is exactly how I would phrase this. I also feel like Percy's kind of had this idealistic view of his dad because 
his dad may have been unfaithful to his godly wife, but he fell in love with his mom and only had one kid. As opposed to, you think about the other campers are living in a cabin with 10 to 15 other people who are proof that their parent... Got loose, baby. Got loose, baby. (laughs) So the more Percy thinks about it, the angrier he gets. And he realizes that he actually does want recognition for completing the quest, but not from the campers, from Poseidon. Hermes then tells him that the hardest part about being a god is that you can't intervene all of the time. If you did, it would seem like preferential treatment. It would create even more problems than it would solve. And he ends this by saying, I believe if you give it some thought, you will see that Poseidon has been paying attention to you. He has answered your prayers. I can only hope that someday Luke may realize the same about me. Whether you feel like you succeeded or not, you reminded Luke who he was. You spoke to him. And Percy says, I tried to kill him. And then Hermes goes on to say that families are messy. Immortal families are eternally messy. Sometimes the best we can do is remind each other that we're related, for better or worse, and try to keep the maiming and killing to a minimum. This is both very funny, but also very sweet and a very good message. Very heartfelt by Hermes here. Yeah, I'm really liking Hermes a lot more. I wasn't as big of a fan because it seemed like he tricked Percy to get him on the boat, but I now really understand where Hermes is coming from, and I feel really bad for him. It's got to be a super tough situation. Is Hermes spelled the same as Hermes? Yeah, I think there might be an accent over the second E for the fashion brand. Is the fashion brand named after Hermes the god? Probably. What? <laughs> so Percy gives it some more thought and he realizes that Poseidon did send the hippocampi. He gave Percy new powers and Tyson as well. And Tyson has proved to be so useful that Percy then wonders if his arrival was intentional, which I feel like it kind of could be. Then a conch horn blows in the distance, meaning that curfew is beginning. So Hermes tells Percy to go to bed, saying that he's got PJ into enough trouble already. He says the only reason he's here is to make a delivery, which surprises Percy. Percy signs for the package, and the stylus is wrapped with George and Martha. Percy is so startled by this that he drops the electronic signature pad, and that causes George to say ouch, and Martha to say, really, Percy? Would you want to be dropped on the floor of a horse stable? Love these two. Glad love they're him. back. I love them. Then they form like a pencil grip for him to write with. Mm-hmm. So cute. Yeah, he says the grip reminds him of a grip that was used by his special ed teacher in second grade. And I think that's very cool, especially because I feel like we haven't gotten as much of the ADHD, dyslexia, different learning style Percy here. So it's cool for that to get a mention. And it hasn't just been completely abandoned by book two. Right, exactly. George asks if Percy brought him a rat. Percy says no, that they didn't find any. He then asks, what about a guinea pig? And Martha chides him for teasing Percy, which raises the question, how much did they know? Hermes acted like he didn't know what was going on. George and Martha know what's going on? This is, again, why I feel like I'd like the companion novel or companion magazine of the, what do they call it, Olympian Weekly? Mm -hmm. Because I imagine that there's just a section on, what's Percy up to today? Scuttlebutt section. (laughs) <laughs> so Percy signs and returns the pad to Hermes, who gives him a sea blue envelope. And I don't know if this is just me, but I feel like sea green is a thing and not sea blue. I feel like I've heard ocean blue. Is that a thing? I feel like I've never heard of sea blue. I don't know, but it surely exists. It, yeah, I just reading it, I thought, huh, that's kind of funny. <laughs> So Percy can sense the power of it when holding it in his hands, and he knows instantly it is from Poseidon. Hermes wishes Percy good luck in the race, but he asks, if you don't mind, I'm going to be rooting for Team Hermes. And I think that that is fun and great, and I really, really like Hermes by the end of this interaction. I also imagine that there is a section in the Olympian Weekly about that. I kind of think of the Olympian Weekly like the Daily Prophet that has moving images and like maybe live streams down to the race even. Yeah, but hopefully not run by corrupt people. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. It's (laughs) definitely run by the god of newspapers. Mm Mm-hmm. New York Timesimus. Oh, no. Johannes Gutenberg, the god of uh, of all things related to printing. He invented the printing press. <laughs> he was actually a demigod. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Son of. Um, Probably Hermes. Messenger God. Oh, I was going to say. Yeah, newspaper. Yeah. I was going to say librarianess or something. <laughs> <laughs> so Martha warns Percy not to be discouraged when he reads the letter. As Poseidon has Percy's best interests at heart. George says, don't mind her. And next time, remember, snakes work for tips. I don't like this. Get out of here. Come on, George. That's gross. No, I think George is joking here. I hope he's joking here. George is being cutesy here. I would hope so. Hermes shushes the snakes, bids Percy adieu, and then small white wings sprout from his pith helmet, which I guess is the old school style helmet that he has. I'm not a helmet aficionado, so I don't really know what's going on there. Percy then turns to avoid seeing him in his divine form because he knows that he's supposed to do this, and Hermes disappears in a flash of light. And then Percy opens the letter, and all it says is brace yourself. 
Gee, thanks, Dad. I feel like we could have figured that one out on our own. Ridiculous. We'll get into this later about what it could mean because Percy thinks about it. But this is where we're going to end this episode. And we will pick it up next time with Kelly again. But Kelly, thank you so much for joining. You're welcome. Brace yourself for the next episode where I'll be back. Exactly. In the meantime, though, if people want to find you doing stuff, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at vote for me, Kelly B. I know that a lot of people have tried to follow me on Instagram. Mike tags me in a lot of things in his story, which is very sweet of him. I don't want anybody to feel sad or rejected if I didn't accept you because I don't actually accept anybody. And I'd like to say that the reason is because I have a nephew, I have nieces, I teach Sunday school to a lot of kids, and I post pictures of those kids, and it feels disingenuous to them and to their parents to allow a lot of followers who don't know those kids or know those parents to see the pictures of them. So I keep my Instagram private, but you are welcome to follow me on Twitter. I'm vote for me, Kelly B. And that's completely public and open. I also have, I love how much Mike loves promoting this. He loves promoting my little side business. I have a store called Magic Shop Patches and that has an Instagram, which is at Magic Shop Patches. And it also has a Twitter, which is at Magic Shop Patch. And I design and produce BTS inspired patches and now stickers and keychains as well, because some of the designs don't lend themselves very well to a thread medium. Yeah. So you can follow me there. If you really insist on following me on Instagram, I'll warn you, it's mostly BTS content there, or you can follow me on my personal or my magic shop patches, Twitter. And then you can also buy the stuff on the Etsy store, or <laughs> you can buy directly via Kelly and then you don't pay Etsy fees. Wee. Wee. Also, who's this other niece that you have? You said you have nieces. Who's our second niece? Oh, I got one niece. I got (laughs) one nephew, one niece, and then a bunch of little friends. (laughs) Well, Kelly, thank you for joining listeners. Thank you for listening. And until next time, when we figure out what's going on with this chariot race and the final book episode for The Sea of Monsters. Brace yourself. Percy, you later. (laughs) (laughs) Percy, you brace yourself. Brace yourself later. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Glow. The music is by Bettina Campomanes and Brandon Grugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you love the show, you cannot get enough of the show, you need some more, you can go to thenewstolympian.com slash Patreon, and you can get access to more bonus episodes, monthly live streams, the Discord, so much fun stuff, all at thenewstolympian.com slash Patreon. And speaking of the Patreon, want to give a shout out to our producer-level patrons, Lada Bartova, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Emma Kui, Vicky Garcia, Ellie House of Chova, Veronica Bartova, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Tough Bayfong, Moo Moo Productions, Don't Call Me an Infidora, Olivia Y, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Minka Dreesen, Can't I Seaweed Brain, Matt Barger, Peter Johnson, The Twins, Sabrina Balsiger, Bony Pony, Getting Stoned with Smelly Gabe, Heather McMillan, Casey Canales, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Bridget Lowry, Josh Sayer, Percy Blue, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Shannon Yvonne's Aguilar, Wise Girl, Alpacas Are Hope, Milo TZ, Roxas 1912, Rafaela, Ashton Gabrielson, Cara Marin, Colby, Marco Redhouse, Falcon, Joey James, Christopher William Boucher, Justin Lux, Caden, Max, Sam, Sam, Ruby, Carly, Allen, Riley, Kitas, Mary Kelly, Audra, Mackenzie, Mrs. O'Leary, Marina Foose, Aaron Wood, Tyler Hendricks, Molly Snyder, Rodith Kalna, and Milo Kim. Now, if you want to support the show, but in a non-monetary way, first, you could follow us on social media. We're at Newest Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We also have a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the Newest Olympian. And then you could talk about us on social media. That really helps. Word of mouth is really huge. Or you could leave a rating and review on whatever podcast app you're using. So Apple Podcasts or Spotify let you rate. If you want to rate us, leave a nice review. That's really nice. But honestly, the biggest thing, word of mouth. Now, if you think of someone that would love the show, reach out to them directly and say, hey, there's this podcast, there's this guy, he's reading the Percy Jackson books for the very first time, I think you're going to like it, here's a link to it. That is huge. All of these things help, and I'm appreciative to all of you who have done it or who will do it in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode, the final book chapter Sea of Monsters episode, guest starring Kelly Beckman Schubert once again to round out chapter 19 and all of chapter 20. But until then, I'll proceed you later. Hey, Vern, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Mike. So I know I'm on the iPhone right now, and that reminded me that I did take some iPhone audio footage when Kelly and I were on vacation in the Dominican Republic. So I hope you enjoy these soothing beach sounds for this edition of ASMR Mike.